Um, yeah, we're recording now. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm very excited about this program. I was just talking to Anne Fristo Stewart and what a story of the, this couple and their creativity is amazing. Um, so I will just let you know a little bit about Anne Fristo Stewart and then we can um, have the program and then there'll be Q&A after. So if you have any questions. Um, Anne Fristo Stewart is the director and curator of the Lieber Museum in East Hampton, New York. She had the great honor of working side by side with Judith and Gerson Lieber until their deaths in 2018. She's dedicated to keeping their legacy alive through the continuation of the museum and through sharing their extraordinary works and the story of their fascinating lives with fans around the globe. Anne received a master's of fine arts degree from Parsons School of Design in New York, where she worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and for artists such as Jeff Koons, Rona Pondick and Kara Walker. During the decade plus that she worked with the Liebers, she curated numerous exhibitions at the Lieber Museum and the Lieber Sculpture Garden, and has worked with many curators around the country to mount Lieber exhibitions at their museums and galleries. The current exhibition at the Lieber Collection is a 100 year commemorative exhibition of Judith and Gerson Lieber titled Centennial Legacy, a celebration of the life, love and art of Judith and Gerson Lieber. Also on view in their sculpture garden are select works from the permanent collection and they include the extraordinary Shelter Island artist, Margaret Garrett, as well as Gerson Lieber, Bill King, Hans van der Bovenkamp, Constantino Nivola, Tony Ross, Philippe Cheng, and more. And the museum is open to the public on Saturdays, Sundays, and Wednesdays from 1 to 4 p.m. and at other times by appointment for private and group tours. So thank you so much, Anne Fristo Stewart. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy you're all here. Um, I also want to thank Jocelyn and Phyllis and the Shelter Island Public Library for inviting me here today. Um, it's always my great pleasure to share the lives and works of Judith and Gerson Lieber. I am going to share my screen. Sorry, one second. Oh my goodness. Talks amongst yourselves for a minute. <laughs> hi, Anne. Thanks for having us. Oh, hi, Cece. Welcome. I'm just pulling my PowerPoint back up because it disappeared. One second. As always. I know. Hi, okay. Cindy. It's Lisa. Looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. It's great to like be on this thing together tonight. Sure is. Hi, everyone. Hi, Allie Pratt. Hi, thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. All right, so. All right, so those of you that missed the intro, I'm Ann Fristo Stewart, and I am the, the director and curator of the Lieber Museum. And the Lieber Collection is a beautiful jewel of a museum in the East Hampton hamlet of Springs. Um, we're dedicated to sharing the life and legacy of Judith and Gerson Lieber through the continuation of their museum and through exhibitions, talks, presentations that showcase their creative genius across the country and around the globe. The Lieber Collection offers a unique insight into the inspiring story of Judith and Gerson Lieber. Judith, um, I'm sorry, um, Judith Lieber is a survivor of Hitler, Hitler's Europe who came to America 
and took the handbag industry by storm, breaking taboos right and left, changing fashion history forever. We also chronicle the extraordinary seven plus decades long career of Gerson Lieber, exhibiting the marvelous paintings, etchings, and lithographs of this highly accomplished and creative artist. The Lieber Collection Sculpture Garden continues the Lieber's lifelong commitment to supporting the arts by highlighting sculptors who were friends and neighbors of the Liebers, as well as contemporary artists, creating some of the most exciting work of today. So it all began in 1921 when Judith was born in Budapest and Gerson was born in Brooklyn. Judith Lieber was born Judith Marianne Petto into a Hungarian Jewish family who was well-to-do, sophisticated, and cultured. Her parents were Emil and Helene Petto, and her beloved older sister was Eva. Judith was well-traveled and loved the arts and music. She adored visiting museums, attending the opera, and loved to swim, ski, and play tennis. Judith attended a top school in Budapest where she was a very gifted student. At the age of 17, Judith's parents sent her to London in order to study chemistry. Oh my goodness. Did we just lose the, oh my gosh. I'm so sorry, everyone. I'm sorry, one second. <laughs> oh. I'll just let everyone know while, while you're setting back up that there'll be time for Q&A uh, after, by the way, everyone. Yes. Um. I'm sorry, everyone, this is quite, Embarrassing. <laughs> okay. I'll point out while we're waiting that um, Anne is in the in the museum and we get to see the handbags behind her. Which are just yes. extraordinary. So she's not in her home, and so she can't control the uh, all of this stuff. So that's all right. Just tell us your story. Okay, and it's um. All right. So I'm sorry, the PowerPoint isn't working properly. So I'm going to read you my story and I'm very, very sorry. Um, you know, maybe we'll try it again at one point. But um, so Judith Lieber, um, when she was 17, her parents sent her to London in order to study chemistry at King's College. Um, and the reason is because Jews were forbidden to attend university in Hungary at the time. It was their plan for her to follow in the footsteps of her great aunt and uncle who owned a very successful cosmetics company in Romania. Judith would laugh and say, I could have been Estee Lauder, but instead I'm Judith Lieber. In the summer of 1939, she came home from London for summer break and on September 1st, the war broke out. It made it impossible for her to travel back to London. Because of Hitler and the anti-Semitic atmosphere and because of the new anti-Jewish laws that existed in Hungary that severely limited the lives of Jews, she knew she needed to learn a trade in hopes that it would help her to get out of Hungary one day. Judith entered the Hung Hungarian Handbag Makers Guild as the first female apprentice and quickly worked her way up from apprentice to journeyman and ultimately to master. She learned the handbag tr trade from start to finish. When Judith was growing up, her mother had many beautiful and fine handbags that her father bought for her during his business travels to the West. 
These became the inspiration for Judith's decision to learn the handbag trade. In the handbag guild, she worked for the top handbag company in Budapest called Pestle Handbags. She started as an apprentice, mixing glues, sweeping the floors, and running errands, and she quickly worked her way up. She said that Hitler made her a handbag designer. As the war broke out, as the war began to rage in Hungary, her father was taken off the streets and put into a labor camp and was forced to dig trenches against the Russian tanks. Judith and her sister Eva went to live in the Jewish Community Center for protection and they sewed trousers for the soldiers. Their father was nearly starved and worked beyond exhaustion in this labor camp. A girlfriend of Judy's had an uncle who worked for the Swiss consulate and through him, she was able to get a Swiss pass, freeing her father from the labor camp and giving him diplomatic immunity. With this Swiss pass, Judy's father was allowed to come to a Swiss protected house to reunite with his family. A young boy, Thomas Boroth, who was a friend of the family, recognized the typeface on the Swiss pass and found a typewriter with the same typeface. He added, and family, after Emil Petto, thus saving the entire family from certain death. In this Swiss house, there was relative security, but little comfort as there were 26 people living in a one room apartment, sleeping on mattresses on the floor from wall to wall. They were not allowed to go outside except at certain times and food was scarce. Judith said, once the Nazis came to Hungary and occupied it, you couldn't work anymore. You couldn't do anything. We were lucky to be alive. As the war advanced, the Hungarian Nazis moved all Jews, even those who were protected, into a Jewish ghetto. Judy and her family were taken at gunpoint with the other families from the Swiss protected house to the walled ghetto as the war raged around them. The conditions were horrific and beyond one's worst imagination. As a means of protection, Judy designed handbags in her head to keep sane as the bombs exploded around her. She said, I tried to fall asleep by dreaming of making handbags. In February of 1945, the Russians liberated Hungary and Judy and her family were allowed to go back to her apartment, but because the windows were broken and the electric and heat were not working, Judy and her family lived in the basement with many other families until the repairs were made, but they had survived. Gerson Lieber was born in Brooklyn, New York. When he was young, his family moved to Titusville, PA. And his parents were Orthodox and he grew up in an extremely strict household. He was a small town boy. And even though he showed talent in art as a young student, his parents did not think this was a means to a job and discouraged him from pursuing art. So he began working as a typesetter for the Titusville Herald. At 19, he entered the United States Army as a signal, car, signal corps sergeant. His service took him to Northern Africa, Italy, and the Mediterranean. And it was in the great museums and galleries of the cities he visited that his love for art was rekindled his eyes were open to all the kinds of possibilities. In early 1945, Gus was sent to Budapest, Hungary with the American legation and as a part of the allied forces there to keep the peace and to help the transitional government, he found himself on the streets of Budapest. And on one of his very first days there, two young women approached him and his mates as they stood outside the pension where they were staying. A friend of Judy's had a room in her family's home that they wanted to rent out to an American. Judy's friend did not speak English and Judy spoke perfect English. So she went with her friend, as she would say, solely as a translator. But this is when Judy met an American soldier who called himself Gus. And as the story goes, it was love at first sight. He asked her to the opera which was one of her very favorite things in the world to do and the rest is history she was pretty very pretty gerson said she had great culture and a great love of music judith immediately knew she wanted to marry gerson she said in an interview 
1945, an American GI was something magical and heroic, and that was Gus. I was completely charmed, and I still am. They courted for a year, engaged, and then married in her parents' home in 1946. Knowing of Gus's deep love of art, Judy went to the Hungarian Royal Academy of Art, where he set up a studio and immersed himself in art making when he was off duty from the army, and Judy designed and made fine handbags for the lady personnel of the American legation. Her handbags were beloved by the American ladies and everything she made was purchased by them. Her green toolbox filled with tools of her trade was her most valued possession. Gus was later given the choice of remaining in the army or being discharged and the Liebers decided that it was time to head to America where Judy could make handbags for a wider audience. So in 1947, they said goodbye to Judy's family and to Budapest, and they boarded a bride ship headed for New York. Judy had her treasured toolbox in hand. They were delighted to be in New York. It was our promised land, Gerson said. Judith said, the memory of the Holocaust was burned into our consciousness, and we, re and we re were relieved to be away from the land where it had occurred. Gus was inspired by his beloved New York City and made prints of her structures, buildings, bridges, rooftops, and power lines. While Gus attended the Art Students League and exhibited his artwork around the country, Judy worked for a number of handbag manufacturers, working her way up the ladder of success. Judy was a phenomenon. New York was emerging as the new fashion capital, and she was the only woman handbag designer in America. Her skills became highly sought after. And before long, sorry. Oh my goodness. Um, before long, she was hired by the finest ladies couture designer in America, Nettie Rosenstein. Soon Judith was running the entire Nettie Rosenstein handbag factory and designing the finest handbags made in America at the time. In 1953, Nettie Rosenstein was commissioned to design Mamie Eisenhower's inauguration day dress, and she chose Judith Lieber to create the matching purse. The small pale pink clutch is delicately embroidered with pearls and rhinestones. This little handbag captured the imagination of women throughout America, and Judith Lieber became a household name. Nearly every first lady from Amy Eisenhower to Laura Bush have carried a Judith Lieber handbag on inauguration day. In 1956, the Liebers bought a country house in East Hampton Springs, and Gus says he was overcome by an all-encompassing desire to garden and he would spend many hours gardening while Judy designed handbags. In 1963, Gus convinced Judy to strike out on her own. He told Judy, you're not gonna work for these schnooks anymore. You're going into business. Judy said, I was scared to death, but I did it. The Liebers rented a tiny loft, 275 square feet to be exact, on Madison Avenue, right around the corner from 33rd Street. And with four employees, they began Judith Lieber Handbags Incorporated. Unlike many men of his time, Gus was willing, even delighted, to put his wife's career first. The very first line of bags they made failed. They were made in a grayish green calf, which the customers did not like, and the timing was off as the bags arrived in stores right after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. But Judy said, our minds were completely focused on achieving success. We were as focused on that as I had been on surviving the Nazi occupation. That experience taught me how to sharpen my focus and aim at specific goals. Gus said, it was hard work. Judy worked day and night. At night, she made patterns, and during the day, she ran the factories. Judy said she made patterns every single day of her life while she was in business. When they traveled to Europe, they went to all the museums in all of the cities, and she found inspiration everywhere. 
in those museums, in antique shops. She even found inspiration in their vegetable garden at their country home in Springs. Gus said that she could see a handbag in everything. She was inspired by books and paintings, museums and music, even James Bond movies. She was inspired by things she would see in yard sales like food dogs and Japanese lunch boxes, Turkish rugs and quilts. In 1991, she created a Minodier inspired by a Gerson Lieber painting. The beating on her Minodiers began not as much as an artistic endeavor, but as a matter of necessity. The plating on the first metal bag was so badly flawed that she realized some disguise was required. She decided that covering the bag with crystals would both hide and enhance, and thus her entire beaded handbag business was born. Her handbags are not merely utilitarian, but are beloved works of art that are adored and collected by many. Women are obsessed with them. Her bags cultivate, captivate and inspire. They're in the collections of some of the greatest museums in the world, the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, the Victorian Albert in London, the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC, just to name a few. The Liebers had a story that when they went to their beloved opera, they would count all the Lieber bags hanging on the shoulders of the ladies, and that it actually became easier after a while to count the bags that were not Liebers. Judith Lieber Handbags Incorporated was hugely successful and they grew and grew. They went from a tiny loft with four employees to a three-story factory in the shadows of the Empire State Building with over 200 employees. In his studio, Gus made paintings, etchings, and lithographs using the fashion world as his muse. The Liebers attended a great many runway shows and he said it was a fertile field for his work. He had his, uh, the pieces that um, he that were inspired by the fashion world, um, we have in the museum in our main gallery surrounding the Judith Lieber handbags because when they were in business in the factory, when the buyers would come in to buy, to order the handbags, Gus's work would be for sale on the walls. So. The fashion series is one of his very beloved series. Um, uh, so later in life, he created wonderful abstract works um, and the abstractions were inspired by his garden and they became more and more abstract as time went by. Judith Lieber designed her last handbag, the Peacock Monodier in 2004. As the peacock personifies grace and dignity, like royalty, one cannot miss the brilliance of this choice as her final design. When visitors view the peacock in the Lieber Collection Museum, they often say, wow, just wow. It was in 2005 that Judith and Gerson opened the Lieber Collection, a magnificent Renaissance structure inspired by the temples that dot the landscapes of the great gardens of Europe. We call it the Lieber Taj Mahal, as Gus built it to honor the creative genius of his wife and to house their extraordinary collections of fashion and art. It's a beautiful container of their devotion to one another. Both Judith and Gerson Lieber passed away in April of 2018. Their legacy will live on in their extraordinary work and through the continuation of the Lieber Collection Museum and Gardens. Writer Mary Gregory said it perfectly when she wrote, in their early days, each of them saw pain and suffering. For the rest of their lives, Gerson and Judith Lieber defined their own realities by seeking and cultivating and producing beauty through an enduring, inspiring love for each other and for life. So thank you all for coming. I um, will, would love to answer questions if you have any. You can and put them in the chat uh, if you want to put them in the chat or just raise your hand. Oh, I see Cecilia Cunningham has a question. That's great, Anne. <laughs> Thank you, Cecilia. 
<laughs> I, I'm uh, curious about the Jewish relationship to Titusville of uh, Pennsylvania. Do you know anything more about that? I've not ever heard about that. Yeah, so there was a, a strong um, community of Orthodox Jews in Titusville, and it was really in the 20s. Um, and Titusville was a big oil um, area. So um, Gus's father felt like he was he wanted to leave Brooklyn and head to try to make you know some of the oil money. He Gus had um, there were seven children in his family, so he had a big family. And um, you know it's interesting. Gus grew up very very poor, and he was he would always say he never realized it. Everyone in Titusville was poor at the time. And Judith grew up very from a very wealthy family. Um, and so, you know, when the two of them came together, they complemented each other so well. But when Gus was in the military, he really became a highly cultured person, you know, just really traveling around the world. He was in the Signal Corps, so he wasn't on the front lines. He was able to to see the you know the great museums and art around the world and you know by the time he met judith he was quite cultured himself charlotte has a question charlotte tar wants to know she's curious what is the most collectible coveted of her designs so hi charlotte welcome so i you know, it's interesting. She had her favorites. Um, the very first Monodier that she designed, the one that I talked about in the talk where <clears throat> it was flawed and she had to really, you know, sort of make lemon aid out of lemons. Um, that was always her favorite. Um, but ones like the Peacock, which was her final design, that one is it's not that it's rare but it's highly sought after so it's one that you know people really love and they and they covet so that's one that is a you know a highly coveted design but you know what judith lieber handbags you know every lady that has one you know there's a story to why she chose that bag and you know so many are you know handed down through generations you know they were gifts for um you know a big occasion and so you know the, it's really the ones it's interesting to see that the ones that um you know it's really determined by the buyer right the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder and there's people that you know say once you have one you, you know you have to have more and they obsess over them and they want to find you know their next favorite bag so um and i think it changes for people too you know at least in the museum people will come in and say oh now i have a new favorite and you know it's like something new catches your eye and you're coveting that one now <laughs> um a cup a couple couple questions are there counterfeits to worry about so there are for sure you know one of the reasons why the levers did sell their business is they felt like you know they couldn't they were seeing counterfeits out in new york city um i think that because these bags are so um labor intensive and such a labor of love there you can tell if it's a counterfeit um you know it, i can tell by just picking it up so a bag that isn't a real judith lieber has a a lighter a lighter weight like the judith lieber bags have a real sort of authority in their the weight the sound when you open or close them um and then a real good telltale is um, the insides. So, you know, someone can work hard to try to um, copy the, the outside, which is really difficult, but once they've gone to all that work, they don't do what she did on the interior, which was she, the interiors are gorgeous and they're all lined with this really beautiful gold kid or silver kid skin and just impeccably connected. So every aspect of a Judith Lieber bag is 
is extraordinary. And, you know, I've been, I have been tricked one time and I've been buying Judith Lieber bags for the museum for, you know, tw 12 or 13 years. And so, you know, you don't see them very often because they're expensive to make, very expensive. So, you know, someone would rather knock off uh, something easier to make. Mm. Um, who runs the company today and are they reissuing her original designs? Yeah, so the company is run by a, you know, a brand, a, a, a large brand corporation. Um, the designers, it's called um, Authentic Brands Group. But the designers, one is um, Jana Matheson, who's been designing for many, many years, and she knew the Liebers and would come out, at, you know, numerous times a year to to meet with us. And she would, you know, look at the the collection. The first thing she would always say was, "Judy, will you design one more?" And Judith would always say, "You know, no, I've really retired, but you know, be inspired." And and she was. And then the other. Um, designer is uh, D Hilfiger. So Tommy's wife is um, designing the Judith Lieber handbags as well. And, um, you know, the they do re-release um, some of the older original, we call them the classic designs. Um, so they say, you know, one of Judith Lieber's most iconic bags is the tomato, right? inspired by her um, vegetable garden and springs and they have re-released a tomato but they you know it's very different when judith lieber was designing these handbags computers weren't even weren't even created and you know they they weren't used right so you know she was a math genius and she could see how to to apply the crystals around a surface and have them meet up on the other side. She could see that in her head. And then she would train people to be able to um, make the handbags. She now they're done on a on a computer. So you can see a very, you know, a difference in the sort of shading of colors where her colors are be, will be more graphic. They may have a tomato that has, you know, 15 different colors. Um, and they also have new, new images and new designs. They really, as every company in America, you know, your goal is to figure out how to reach the millennials, right? They're the largest generation ever in the history of the world. And so they also are unique that they don't buy a lot of things. They want experiences. So they work very hard to figure out, um, you know, what the millennials will want and what they want to buy. And one of the, you know, they have, you know, Judith Lieber created food handbags, right? When she first made the tomato or the, you know, the, eggplant you know people were like what that's a handbag oh my gosh and then people loved them they couldn't get enough of them so now d Aklepo has you know d hilfiger has um you know she designs you know hamburger minotiers and hot dogs and french fries and you know it's that same sort of creative whimsy of you know making something out of you know, an everyday object that you would not expect to be a handbag. And so, and then she also is inspired by artists. So she'll make bags that are, you know, pop art. Whereas Judith Lieber was inspired by people like, you know, Mondrian, um, George Brock, uh, Sonia Delaunay. So it's the same, you know, they're just being inspired by current artists. So there's a lot of similarities. They do strive to design in her in her manner and i think they they do for the most part yeah um couple more questions are you still looking for bags to add to the museum and how many of each design of a bag were made when judith ran the company so we are always looking one of the goals of the museum is to have one of every one of her designs she's designed over 
3,500 individual designs. We have about 1,700. So we're about halfway there. We don't have a, you know, catalog resume. We don't have, you know, the work was done before computers. So we have, you know, notebooks with little line drawings, but we don't have a full catalog. So we're kind of looking, you know, like a needle in a, in a haystack. We're constantly looking. People always send me pictures of bags they've seen at auction or in a, you know, a vintage handbag shop um, or they may have them um, you know their grandmother left them to them or their mother we just got a um, a collection of this wonderful woman Kay Morrissey who she passed away and she had three children and they really they each took some but she had a huge collection and they wanted the collection to stay together and you know and be housed somewhere so they've donated that just recently to the museum and it's about 90 90 handbags um so we do um you know we're constantly looking in terms of um the amount per that were originally made the um the way that Judith would design is she would make the prototype, she would make the first bag, and she would have maybe five, sometimes six um, uh, releases. And those would go into the showroom and buyers would come. And so if a buyer, you know, bought 10, and then another buyer came in and bought 200, I mean, they would put you know it would go into production and they would begin filling orders so, so she said she never made less than 12 of one bag which is really a low number but the one you know when she, the one that made that she made the most of was about 3500 so anywhere between 12 and 3500 but every single handbag had a different amount um because it was they were really filling orders yeah um cecilia it looked like you have a question oh you have to unmute <laughs> this is so interesting because the the kind of american uh, uh european uh artist for women was quilting right so mm -hmm. I have a very good friend on the North Fork, Paula Nadelstern, and she's this big quilter. And then the beading is something very different. I, I had a, a very good friend in Brooklyn whose mother came from um, uh, Italy and she was a beater. And so there, and also we know that Native Americans did a lot of beading, right? Mm -hmm. so I'm like curious about maybe we don't know anything yet about how she might have made all of these kind of women's crafts uh, come together. And maybe that's like worth more research around it. Yeah, she definitely was inspired by, um, you know, women's handy work. So, you know, in, in Budapest, where she grew up, Petty Point was a, um, yes. a craft that was everyone knew petty point it was something that was done constantly and when she went into business she went back to budapest to try to get petty point as a fabric to use for for handbags but at that point hungary was communist and there was no there were no mass uh you know uh, factories that were making you know large amounts of anything and so she was able to get tiny small pieces of petty point and we have bags that she designed you know very small but with beautiful work um and then in terms of quilting she has a lot she was inspired a lot by quilting and she has you know monodiers that have like one is an egg that has the quilting design that's called you know a wedding quilt yes. but it's that was her inspiration but in in the i think it was the 70s um happy rockefeller was working with a group of women in appalachia because happy wanted to make sure that they had an, an you know an industry and they were 
highly skilled quilt making uh, women. And so Happy went and she um, collaborated with Judith Lieber and the women in Appalachia made fabrics that Judith Lieber used for handbags. Am I frozen? No, okay. Um, and also another thing is that she collected fabrics from around the world. So, you know, she's most known for the metal bags, the Minotiers, but she has these gorgeous um, day bags that are created from the obis that um, are the Japanese sashes that go around the robes. And she collected these antique obis from around the world and then cre would create fabrics. Um, she also um, collected the Parsi ribbons that were the ribbons on the edges of the robes, and then she would put them together and create a single fabric out of these ribbons. And a lot of times in between there would be, you know, satin or, or some, uh, you know, a fine kid, and then those, um, you know, antique fabrics would become a handbag. But you'll have to come to the museum because we have examples of all these, and she was just extraordinary, you know. One day a gentleman walked in with a group of ladies and he was very quiet and he was just walking. And, you know, I always like to talk to the guests and I walked over and was standing beside him and I'm like, well, what do you think? And he was like, well, there's not a dud in the bunch. <laughs> it's so <laughs> true because they're extraordinary. And, you know, she was just such an incredible um, craftsperson and artist, yep. Did um, did Judith do any designs only for a specific retailer like Bergdorf's or? So she she designed for all the all of the big department stores. So you know they will you'll have if you get a bag that was say for Bergdorf's or Saks or you know any of the big department stores, there'll be her signature inside. But then there's usually a second tag that'll say um, you know whatever that that store is um and you know she designed for small boutiques and big department stores you know she sold a lot in uh las vegas in the <laughs> you know all of the um you know the shops that were were over there and you know there are communities that you know were great fans like the you know ladies of houston or you know the ladies of new orleans and obviously the ladies of new york um but yes yeah, so she did design for those big um big department stores and even you know in those days the department stores were you know so different and she would actually go and she would be present and she would you know people could come and talk to her about her designs and um you know gus would have work in the department store like in Saks, there would be some of his paintings and people would buy them from you know it was a completely different world back then so, so um betty lynn wants to know were those exclusive only to that retailer then so no, typically um, they, you know, uh, the the buyers from these stores would come in and buy. She was selling to any of the the stores. Now, there's been cases of, um, you know, a smaller boutique or say one of the um, the Las Vegas stores will um, will will commission something um for that for themselves right to either to give to their you know biggest clients or to sell in their store and then you know that would be an exclusive but a lot of the big department stores um she would sell in all of them mm -hmm. i mean usually people ask are any of them one of a kind and i always say you know they they the the frames were always existing frames but there are many people that she would make a bag for like you know a woman that loved butterflies you know she would make a butterfly in a special color for that lady or you know obviously the first ladies you know with with those relationships the first lady would come into the factory and she would choose an existing frame and then 
then Judith would work with the designer of the gown and they would, you know, decide whether it was going to be the same fabric or matching or, you know, they would figure out how the bag would, um, you know, relate to the gown. And but it was always an existing frame, but with special fabrics. Ali Pratt, did you have a question? I was just going to say that from the time I was just, you know, 17 or so, my mother and I would go to Bergdorf Goodman all the time and we would, you know, it was on the main floor. So when you walked in, we would stop by Judith Lieber mm. and we would look at all the bags and admire mm. them. And occasionally she would buy one, but not that often, but sometimes. And we'd look at which ones came in new and touch them and look at them. And I actually think that one time we met Judith Lieber. Oh, wow. Or I think so. But it was just a magical thing to just be be there and see them and, you know, then have lunch at Bergdorf's. It was a different time. It really was yeah. a different a different thing. And, and, the, and then my mother would get dressed up and wear her bag. And just to see the whole thing, it was it was magical. It was really magical. Yeah, I mean, she was sort of a rock star, you know, she would travel and go to boutiques in, you know, LA or around around the country mainly, but also to Harrods in, in London and, you know, people would flock to see her and hear her talk and she would, you know, she, you know they get to hold her handbags, which, you know, is rare. So yeah, she was she was extraordinary. And like you say, I mean, it is a way that, it, you know, sh these handbags bring people together through generations, right? I had this fantastic woman that came in one day um, and she walked in the, in the museum and she had this really beautiful Minodier in her hand. And it was one of, it was the very first um, Chatelaine, which is the first uh, metal bag. And I, we had uh, some later versions of that bag in the museum, but we didn't have that very first design. And she walks in with it and I'm just like so excited. And, but she had a long face and I was like, you know, what's going on? And she was like, well, my mom passed away and she left me this handbag. And I was like, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss, but what, you know, why the long face? And she was like, well, you know, she started telling me all of these stories about her mom and she was phenomenal. This mom, she was a designer in New York City, you know, extraordinary woman. And I was like, I was like, well, uh, still what, you know, why are you so sad? This is like a beautiful story. And she said, well, she left me this bag and I have two daughters. <laughs> uh -huh. And it was so hilarious because she was like, what am I going to do? So she donated the bag to us. And on her mother's birthday, she and her two daughters come to the museum every year to, you know, say hi to the, her mother's one bag. And it's just such a sweet, you know, they bring people together in a beautiful way. Yep. Um, Heather wanted to know, she said she loves the humor of the whimsical bags, pizza, taco, hamburger. What made her decide to do those? So um, the, the pizza and the hamburger, the taco, those were made after Judith Lieber passed away. And those were created by um, Dee Hilfiger, who is one of the designers. And she um, really came up with those in the tradition of Judith Lieber, because if you had seen my slides, which I'm so apologetic about, but you know, she designed lots of food, typically vegetables, but, you know, she designed the tomato, the asparagus, the um, eggplant, you know, these things that people are like, what? Like, wh that's a handbag, but they just, they got so much attention that now they're some of the most iconic Judith Lieber bags. And so the company that still exists and is still you know creating these beautiful judith lieber bags they really try to to design in her style so they thought you know well what would judith lieber be designing today and what would speak to the millennials that you know everyone needs to try to speak to in business and these were the 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 images and and she was right i mean there's tons of people on the runways that are 
you know, on the red carpet and, you know, at all these galas that are wearing, you know, the hot dog, or the hamburger, the pizza. <laughs> so it's very funny. A, a couple more things. Um, Joanne said she remembers a fun anecdote about Beverly Sills. Does that ring any yes, bell? Yes, yeah. yes. So Beverly Sills, I'm sure you all know, is a very famous opera star. And um, Beverly and the Liebers were great friends. But when they met, Gus and Judy were in Italy on business and they were at their, um, well, it's not a hotel, but a, a pension, say. And they were in the lobby and in walks Beverly Sills. And Judith Lieber, just went crazy and she ran over and she was like i know you don't know me but i'm you know judith lieber and i'm one of your greatest fans and beverly sills was like of course i know you you know you're judith lieber and i'm one of your fans and they became fast friends and um judy so and judith and gus from their first date of the opera till you know they really got too old to go to the opera they went to every show and so they she would invite them to every one of her opening nights and as you know when you go to an opening night you bring the the diva um, a bouquet of flowers but they never brought her a bouquet of flowers they always brought her a monodier and so when she passed away she had something like 200 judith lieber monodiers so yeah it was a i was like i want <laughs> i want to be friends i want friends like that yeah wow. What's your, um, what is your personal, do you have a personal favorite bag? So I am very, very lucky. I have two children, two girls and my husband. And from when I started working at the Lieber Museum, every Mother's Day, they give me a Judith Lieber Monodier. And one that I had always wanted was the Buddha. And it's so stunningly beautiful. And it's like a Buddha that's, you know, sitting crisscrossed and in the robes and you know just gorgeous and i always loved that one and they did find it for me um maybe three years ago and that's really one of my all-time favorites um i do love the art inspired envelopes you know for a number of reasons i love you know the mondrian or you know the sonia delaunay pieces they're very beautiful but those those um, envelopes were incredibly difficult technically to make. So they're the the different colored skins are all different skins. So when you have these different skins, everything is a different thickness. And so she pieced these um, you know colors together. And you know to do that, she had to skive the edges so that that it created a uniform thickness so that they could be sewn. And nobody does that. You know, I mean, some people obviously do, but it's very rare because it's so difficult technically. And so you really, when you look at those bags, you're just, you know, kind of blown away, not only by the beauty, but sort of the technical difficulty of, of creating something like that. It's impressive. Any, any other questions? You've been, oh yeah, Cecilia wants to say um, something. I've done a lot of petty point in my life and made bags, right? And so I'm talking about the technical aspects, but I think you just did answer a little bit about it, right? So you get a stamp, right? And then you get your yarn and I imagine it's beads on, beads on, what did she use as to, put the beads together was it silk thread was it what, what uh so all of all of her um beaded bags she used Swarovski crystals so Swarovski yeah. is in um Austria and she her grandmother um had a uh very famous women's hat factory in in Vienna and she spent a lot of her childhood there so when she you know needed to figure out how to save this first bag you know she her factory was in the accessories district in new york she ran down she grabbed swarovski crystals and a jeweler's glue and saved the day but what happens is those um when she 
originally designs a um, metal bag. The the bag is made, the shape is made by a sculptor that worked with her, you know, the entire time she was in business. And he had a desk right next to hers in her office. His name was Larry Kallenberg, and he was extraordinary, an incredible artist. And he said that, you know, she would be running an empire and then she'd be like, no, I want the pig's mouth to do a little more of a up, you know, uptick, or I want the eye to look sweeter, or you know, no, 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 I want the head to tilt, and then she'd be back to running an empire. So when they, when he had created the wax to be exactly what she wanted, that wax would be shipped to to Italy, and there's a company called Casamonti that worked on her metal bags the entire the entire time she was in business and they still make the metal part of the metal bags now for the company. But so the, the wax would go to Casamonti. Casamonti would make a big metal die. So, um, you know, it could be like the cat, you know, has something like a hundred parts to the mold, which is a die. And then it's, they're created out of sheet metal because she wanted to create a bag that the ladies didn't have to go to the safety deposit box to take out of the bank when they went, uh, you know, went out at night. So she designed these bags to be made out of gold or silver plate. So the sheet metal was heated. It was brass heated, you know, pressed in these dies, then opened up and the shells would be popped out. They would gold or silver plate them and send them back to her factory in Manhattan. They would then clean them up. They would, you know, take off any, you know, excess metal. They would polish them. They would um, put them together. They would line them if they had a, a shoulder strap, which all of hers do, except the cat and the horse, um, they would put on the, the shoulder, the shoulder strap, and then they would go into the beading uh, part of the factory. And so I was saying before, she would design the first bag. So, and she could see, you know, where the, ba where the beads had to, you know, be applied to the surface to match up perfectly. And, um, and so from that first one, there were five people that she trusted to take her design and copy it exactly on the production, right? So these five individuals would, um, there was a white gesso that was painted on the metal, and then they would actually paint the colors that would be applied in crystal. So that then they would go to the beaters part of the, you know, the women that were actually putting the, the crystals onto the surfaces, and they would basically, you know, not paint by number, but bead by color, right? And so they would take, you know, the, uh, the, the cuticle sticks, the wooden ones, they have one pointy edge and one tapered edge. That's what they used. And they put a dollop of beeswax on the end and they would have these little trays of all the different colors of crystals that would go on the surface. They would take the tapered end, dip it into the adhesive and make a line on the surface, you know, a very tiny line. Then they would flip the tool over, pick up the crystal with the beeswax and apply them in place. They may do five at a time and then get more adhesive, five more. And that's how these were created. I mean, extremely labor intensive. So but the beads were not connected to each other with silk or string and beaded like we know beaded they were applied directly to this that's right i mean think more of like the south american you know mm -hmm. like you know whatever the right. snakes where they have the whole surface is beeswax and then they lay the the um the beads into that oh. you know, her surfaces weren't um beeswax but they were they were glued onto the surface and <clears throat> going back to that very first metal bag you know when she ran down to the accessories district and grabbed some adhesive it was a jeweler's adhesive and she used that for the first bags but what happened was she realized that two things one was that <clears throat> with that adhesive 
the shoulder strap would knock against the the crystals and knock them off. Right, so right. she immediately designed a hinging system so that the all of the shoulder straps hinge right in, into the inside of the bag and you don't even realize that a shoulder strap is in there. But that way you could either carry it as a oh. as a clutch or as a shoulder bag, right? So and then she, you know, she was she had studied chemistry at King's College. She was a brilliant, you know, science mind and she created a adhesive that's water based, but that it hold, you know, sticks like glue. It's a really extraordinary adhesive. And so now the shoulder straps don't knock off the crystals and they are glued with this incredible, you know, they they still use it today. They call it the secret sauce because it's just a great adhesive. And, you know, the fact that it's water based is, you know, amazing too. So no toxic chemicals. I never would have thought that. I thought that they would have been beaded together and then adhesed. That's yeah, I know. Yeah. In the very, very early days, like, you know, 64, you know, they started their business in 63. And, and back then, there was a, a fabric that crystals or beads would be, um, you know, already on a fabric. And <clears throat> she did create some, um, like handles out of that. So sometimes when you see a handle that's all crystals from the 60s, that was created with a fabric that already had crystals on it. But she didn't, she never did that for a Minotier and then also quickly gave that up because it looks like a fabric that, you know, is a, is one piece. And with, when you apply these crystals to a surface, the way that the light reflects off of it is, you know, like looking at a fine diamond, right? Where the light just, you know, really shoots out. And that's the same with these bags because each um, crystal is applied separately. So she made Swarovski famous. They probably owe her a lot of money in the long run. Yes, we think so. No, she, <laughs> you know, they make bags now that look exactly like a Judith Lieber. You know, it's interesting. But originally, I think someone asked, you know, wh why, you know, why the metal bags? Why the, um, why the beads? And, you know, she was inspired way back from in childhood. She saw a show of Fre uh, Frederick the Great's um, uh, snuff boxes. And there are these incredibly gorgeous, you know, over the top, you know, um, stone, you know, with, I mean, he, those had real diamonds and, you know, her bags all have semi-precious stones and um and crystals but he had you know precious stones and fine gems but that was something that she had remembered from being a child and being you know really drawn to so um she has one or maybe two designs that are you know straightforward inspiration of of his snuff boxes but all of her beaded bags you know that first thought how am i going to save this really came from seeing that when she was a child. You know, so and the that, eggs that are, you know, inspired by Fabergé, you know, it's a similar thing. It was a show she had seen when she was a child. And, you know, it's like, you know, the, these gorgeous, you know, egg bags that were inspired by you know, something that was, you know, that you would have to take, you know, to the safety deposit box if you were going to, um, you know, keep it safe. Mm -hmm. You know, in her bags, it would be thousands of dollars. You know, she she wanted to create a bag that, you know, all women could carry. Um, you know, so she at least brought it down from the hundreds of thousands to the thousands, but they were very expensive bags. Mm -hmm. It's also the, uh, the what you see in Iran and and um, uh, India, right? Where they take precious jewels, they cut them thin, they place them on things, and those things are incredibly expensive. You sometimes see them, and you know, well, the um, Taj Mahal is a great example of it. So mm -hmm. it's almost as if she took that idea and made it for us to wear. Not that I have one, but 
That's yeah. Such a great idea. Oh my God. I know she was extraordinary. I mean, and you have to think that, you know, she survived the Holocaust. She came over to America in 40, 46, you know, started working for other handbag designers and worked her way up. She was, you know, classically trained in Budapest and then came where, you know, <clears throat> America was on the assembly line and, you know, she knew how to design a handbag from start to finish. But in America, you know, one person was doing one thing, one person was doing the next. And, you know, it was incredibly frustrating for her. So, you know, she kind of walked into the, you know, head of the New York handbag guild and said, you know, I need a, you know, a better job. This is what I can do. And, you know, that's when she, he sent her over to Nettie Rosenstein and was like, he didn't believe she could really do what she could do. And, and, but she could. And, you know, soon she was running the whole Nettie Rosenstein handbag factory and was highly sought after. You know, when she started her own business, <clears throat> she had a Rolodex of all of the, the buyers that had been buying from the companies her whole life. And, because she was Judith Lieber and everyone in New York knew her, you know, all the department stores knew her, you know, she said that first line was a flop, but it was more because, you know, nobody was buying handbags, you know, right after JFK was assassinated, you know, people were, their minds were in a different place. And so, you know, from that first, what she calls a flop, she said she learned to never put all of her creative eggs in one basket. So she always would offer multiple um, surfaces, so different skins, different fabrics, and also multiple colors. But, you know, you just imagine coming over, you know, sort of working her way up in the Hungarian Handbag Makers Guild, she was the only female. And then coming to America, she was the only female handbag designer. Um, so, you know, she really, you know, you have to work harder if you're a female in, in that kind of world. And she was just so extraordinary and creative that the ladies couldn't get enough, you know? And of course, they, they usually worked in skins. So she added yeah. all these other elements, which is just an amazing story. That's right. And that also most designers have sort of a niche, right? Yeah. And they they very rarely swerve outside of that thing that they're known for. And I mean, when you come to the museum, you'll see she designed so many different bags and you can always tell it's a Judith Lieber, but she never stayed in one lane. You know, she really wanted to make something for everyone, right? Oh, Charlotte Tarr is talking about um, a fundraiser that they're doing in um, in Naples, um, where yeah. they're highlighting Judith Lieber bags. Yeah. Um, one last question, because you've given us so much information and been so generous with your knowledge. I don't want to exhaust you, but one last question. Um, are her designs copyrighted? So they are. Um, but it, you know, it's interesting how, you know, you can get around that, right? You know, it's something in fashion that is very difficult to enforce, right? So, I mean, <clears throat> there's many designers like, you know, Isaac Mizrahi that, you know, people rip, ripped him off or even Donna Karen and, you know, then they, they have to move into another, you know, type of design, but it's very hard with fashion to enforce a copyright because mm -hmm. you can make slight changes and, and be able to get, you know, to get away with it. Right. Well, thank you so much. It's fasc wow. fascinating lives and a really incredible love story and you know so much about it. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. It was really fun. Yes, thanks everyone. Hi, Betty Ann. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Delightful, thank you. Thank you so much, that was great. Thank you for coming. <laughs>